Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's webinar, Discover the World of Plastic Bearings. My name is Michael Hardy. I'll be moderating today's event. I'd like to introduce our speakers, Matt Mowry and Nicole Lang. Matt Mowry is the Dryland Product Manager at IGIS Inc. And Nicole Lang is the iGlide Bearings Product Manager at IGIS Inc. Also today, we would like to thank Dr. Donna Meyer of the University of Rhode Island for contributing technical knowledge to today's event. Dr. Meyer is a professor of mechanical engineering specializing in tribology and fluid mechanics. I'd like to start today's webinar by turning the microphone over to Nicole Lang. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Today we'll discuss the development of polymers, some of the advantages that polymers offer, then we'll do a comparison on simple polymers versus composite polymers, and discuss selection criteria that should be taken into consideration when talking about polymers as bearing materials. First, we'll talk a little bit about polymers in general, specifically about natural polymer lubricants, oils and greases, when they're incorporated into solids, and then more specifically about plastics and rubbers. So oils and greases are polymeric substances which have been used successfully as lubricants for quite some time. Incorporating lubricants into solids has become a means to accommodate bearing surfaces in extreme temperatures with heavy loads and at low speeds, leading to materials consisting of a base polymer combined with solid lubricants and strengthening filaments. Polymer bearings include plastics and rubber, many of which are fabricated from organic compounds with chemical compositions, primarily of carbons and hydrogens. Polymers offer the same effectiveness as solid lubricants alone, with the added benefit of being quiet during operation, with having vibration dampening effects, and require only moderate machining tolerances since they can form to counterfaces easily. Why you might use a polymer bearing? Bearing materials made from polymeric substances have been shown to be advantageous when fluid lubricants are not viable due to extreme environments, including high temperatures or low temperatures, and with corrosive systems. They're also advantageous when the use of fluid lubricants are poised to cause contamination of food, pharmaceuticals, or in the vicinity of sterilized medical devices. Some other advantages of using polymeric materials include when fluid lubricants create challenges with proper maintenance procedures, or when the fluid lubricants do not offer the appropriate levels of boundary lubrication that's required when one of the mating surfaces is metal. Some possible environments for bearing applications made of plastic bearings. Ideal environments for polymer-based bearings include those where surfaces are submerged or par partially submerged in aquatic surroundings. So oftentimes marine environments lend themselves to high incidence of corrosion and biofilm formation, both of which may be mitigated with appropriately chosen polymer surfaces. Coefficients of friction for various sliding surfaces articulating in marine applications can vary widely because of the changes in fluid lubricant characteristics with time helping to make plastic, plastic bearings a potential alternative for maintaining steadier co friction, coefic excuse me, friction coefficients with much smaller and often negligible variations over time. Another possible environment for use of polymer bearings would be agriculture. So in agricultural processes where fluid lubricants attract contaminants such as dirt and dust, polymer materials help offer resistance to the adhesion of these macro and micro sized substances onto machine components requiring less maintenance. Medical and laboratory equipment is another possible environment for a plastic bearing. Contamination-free requirements such as those found in hospital settings and when medical devices are implanted into the human body, for example, favor fluid lubricant-free materials, in particular when biocompatibility is necessary. Many polymer materials offer self-lubricating qualities favorable in these applications help require no downtime for maintenance or relubrication. And another possible environment is, would be packaging, so food and pharmaceuticals specifically. Essential in packaging of drug and food manufacturing products are contamination-free systems. So regular detergent washdowns of these systems when using polymer-based bearings that are self-lubricating helps to eliminate subsequent, subsequent relubrication, further minimizing manufacturing downtimes. We'll talk a little bit about simple polymers. In solid form, pure polymeric materials, so those without any fillers or fibers, such as PTFE and polyethylene or PE, as examples, have structures alternating with weak amorphous or crystalline layers when woven together. For the case of PTFE, there are no functional groups in its structure that would make the material stiff, 
Instead, it's actually quite soft, often allowing for even small loads to cause some form of deformation. In solid form, pure or simple polymeric materials have a few advantages and limitations as bearing materials. The main advantage is that when sliding against harder, rough materials, molten clumps of polymer detach, forming a transfer film on the counterface. So the result is a thin transfer film, in the case of PTFE, and thin streaks for PE. Even though coefficients of friction are quite low, usually not higher than 0.1, high rates of wear may be present. So now, after talking about simple polymers a little bit, let's discuss some limitations of simple polymers. The top image shows how a harder, rough counterface articulating against a simple polymer may result in high wear rates upon sliding, with the hard surface plowing through the softer, simple polymer. Due to polymers being poor conductors of heat, the middle image shows that frictional heating results from this low thermal conductivity combined with the generally low melting temperatures of simple polymers. Cold flow of some simple polymers occurs under load, even when temperatures are not at all present. A characteristic called the solubility parameter is a means to determine when the damage to polymers will be adversely induced by solvents in the vicinity of a contact as illustrated on the bottom image. When the value of this parameter is similar for both solvent and polymer, the solvent can weaken and then consequently cause the polymer surface to crack. Simple polymers are in in general, viscoelastic and therefore deform easily due to strain rate dependence, making their use suitable mainly in moderately low bearing systems. Now let's talk about composite polymers in comparison to simple polymers. So composite polymers offer improved mechanical strength, improved wear resistance, and they help to reduce the coefficients of friction over a um, simple polymer. Composite polymer bearings are generally plain sliding bearings comprised of simple polymer matrices, um, which provide for low, co co low coefficients of friction, excuse me, coupled with solid lubricants also helping to aid in mitigating friction, along with fiber and filaments, which reinforce the load carrying cap capacity of the bearing by supporting high forces or edge loads on the bearing and providing resistance to wear. Some advantages of a uh, composite polymer is that they help improve mechanical and thermal properties the addition, with the addition of reinforcing fibers or filaments. They also help to reduce wear rates and they are effective under both high and low load. A few more advantages important to note would be low coefficients of friction with mating materials. They are inert, biocompatible, self-lubricating. They help to serve as a reservoir for boundary lubricants tune material properties, and make you can actually make a polymer bearing into most shapes, molding or machining wise. Some selection criteria when discussing um, potentially implementing a plastic bearing into your application would be maximum load, sliding speed, environmental conditions, counterface roughness, PV limit, and the wear factor K. So PV factor uh, or limit is essential, and we're going to talk about that a little bit further along in the webinar. It defines a value consisting of the nominal contact pressure, P, and surface velocity, V. The product of these two variables, P and V, helps provide a measure of the limits of frictional heating and wear that will be present under specific conditions when using polymers as a bearing material. When polymers exceed their empirically determined PV limit, degradation of the polymeric material is probable. The wear factor, or other wise known as specific wear rate K for polymer bearings is a measure of the volume lost per normal load times the sliding dif distance with lower K values indicating low wear rates. And at this point I'd like to turn it over to Matt Mowry. Thanks Nicole. What we're going to take a look at in the next few slides is how composite plastic bearings compare to simple plastics, to bronze bearings, to PTFE lined or metal back bearings, as well as ball bearings. We don't pretend that plastic bearings work in every application, so well, it's important for us to take a look at how they compare with these other products. So the difference is mainly that make an IGUS composite plastic bearing different than a, a simple plastic bearing is that we take a, a base plastic, so we do use simple plastics, but into those simple plastics we add fillers such as glass fibers, carbon fibers, and others to increase the strength and wear resistance of the part. We also introduce a matrix of solid lubricants to reduce the friction and uh, help, the, the help the part move easier under load. So again, composites enhance, this, this is the, 
the makeup of a plastic bearing. You have a base a base polymer with the fillers and again the solid lubricants. This is just kind of a sketch showing the how the part would look under a microscope. To compare the friction and wear rates, we have a number of materials here. Um, we do go to a lot of customers who, again, are going to machine or injection mold their own simple plastics. One of those would be something like a nylon 66 or a polyamid 66. You see, that's the turquoise, um, uh, turquoise part here on these graphs. You see that the the friction and wear of these compared to the latter three, the IGUS L280, the IGUS J, and the IGUS H370. Both the wear and friction of the polyamide 66 and the polyacetyl um, are considerably higher than the composite plastic bearings offered by IGUS. And these values come from our test lab under the same load condition and parameters. So to compare, our bronze bearings are very common. I know everybody's used to seeing them. You can even buy them at your local, local hardware store. But uh, bronze bearings, uh, basically 1930s technology is when they kind of came out around the automotive um, industry. They're ideal for high speed and rotational movement um, because in that, when they are moving at high speeds in fully rotational applications, they're able to draw the oil out from inside the bearing cavity itself and create a lubricant film on the shaft. So that's how uh, bronze bearing lubricates. That means that oscillating applications or low speed applications or linear or even inter intermittent use applications can all inhibit this process and increase wear. So that's a little bit different in that a plastic bearing because it has that homogenous design of the, the solid lubricants with the uh, reinforcing fibers. Our parts are continually re-lubricating the shaft and it doesn't matter what the, uh, what the speed or load is. So some benefits of bronze bearings is that they do have a low coefficient of friction if the proper lubrication is maintained, and they do, they you do they are required to be re lubricated in many instances. They are slightly more precise because they have a thermal low thermal expansion, and again you can use them under high speeds, um, higher speeds than a dry running plastic bearing. That's important to note too. Uh, plastic bearings can reach the speeds of and friction values of some of these other components like bronze bearings if they happen to be lubricated. Where they're uh, not used very well in are um, they, they have very limited application temperatures so we need you need to check with the manufacturer of that particular bronze part to to make sure you're using within the right temperature specs. They don't work well in uh, chemical or corrode uh, they don't have very good chemical or corrosion resistance. They're not very ideal for dirty environments because of the oil and lubrication helps to draw the dirt in from the environment, introducing dirt into the bearing system, increasing friction, changing friction, and potentially causing failure or shaft damage down the line. Uh, they, they must be or are recommended to be reamed at installation. So there are a few different steps to the process of installing a bronze bearing than there is with a plastic part. Um, you, most of the IGUS plastic parts are simple press fit parts not requiring any additional um, machining steps. They're also unsuitable for linear motions and they have low impact uh, capability because they're a sintered part they are uh, prone to um, prone to to shattering. I know a couple of applications we've had is um, on agricultural or lawn mower uh, accounts where a user, an end user, will use the lawn mower in the summertime, store it in the during the winter in the garage during sub freezing temperatures then it comes springtime again and they're going to mow the lawn they notice a change in friction in the application it could also be a squeaky noise I know in the clutch pedal of my my pickup truck actually squeaks it has a bronze bearing in there and somewhere along the lines the coefficient is uh, friction has changed and now there's a squeaking um, effect that you hear with these these things are avoided with a plastic bearing that has a constant coefficient of friction over its lifetime so uh, the benefits again of a of a plastic bearing, I kind of went over some of these. I got jumped the gun on the last slide. Is that uh, higher static loads are possible? So you see the comparison here: an eye guide part of um, 21,500 psi and a bronze part under 8,000. Um, again, no no lubrication or maintenance required with the I guess plastic part. They are better in aggressive environments because they don't have lubrication to draw in any dirt and dust. They can be used in any type of application be it rotational, uh, pivoting or oscillating, as well as linear. 
and they also perform well under impact loads and high vibrations. They can also be used uh, with non-hardened shaft materials. So if you're going to have an application that you're going to use a steel part, or you want to use stainless steel, with an igus plastic or, an, or a plastic bushing, you can use a softer stainless steel, which is more corrosion resistant than the hardened stainless steels that other bearing systems might require, like bronze bearings. They're also lightweight and can be combined with aluminum shafting, for instance. I know one of our largest industries that we work with is the aircraft interiors um, industry, which requires very low weight parts as well as automotive parts. So this was an application where I guess plastic composite bearings replaced bronze bearings in the main pivot points of this dump truck. Um, they saved time and money during the assembly process of the parts. They eliminated the need for the reaming that is required for the bronze part. Also with the very low speed, coupled with the fact that there was dirt and dust in the environment, the bronze bearings weren't performing how the customer wanted. Over time, there were failures. Um, plastic parts, again, are self-lubricating, so the, the, it doesn't matter if they don't move very often um, as far as re-lubricating themselves because it's all solid lubricants. They're also better suited for impact loads. As you can imagine, this this, this truck does see some pretty heavy impacts as it drives down the road and gets loaded. All right, the next bearing material that's very common um, in the industries that we service is uh, PTFE metal-backed bearings. Um, these are 1950s technology. There's a split layer of steel that has a that's um, bonded has a bonded bronze uh, PTFE impregnated liner. And uh, these parts also normally use lead. I'm thinking that some of the some of the customer or some of the companies that make these products also might have lead-free parts. I'm not sure how the wear resistance is with without the lead, but um, most of the time they do include lead. Some good things about PTFE metal back bearings is that they're good for thermal conductivity because they are a, a, a metallic part, so they can hit dissipate the heat better than plastic parts. Nicole's going to talk about PV value again in a little bit. She touched on it earlier, but that does uh, give them some advantage to, to PV. Um, their ability, they have a better ability to withstand very high operating temperatures, and they have uh, a max speed of 1,000 feet per minute. The negatives are that they have a very thin wear surface, so if that is compromised by dirt or dust, think of it as your Teflon pan at home. If it gets scratched, that surface is going to start to peel right away. So they're not necessarily that ideal for very aggressive environments. They also corrode because they have a steel, they're steel backed. They have lead, they're heavier than plastic bearings, and they have kind of a difficult installation process, more difficult than a simple IGUS press fit. The advantages of a plastic composite bearing versus a PTFE metal back bearing is that they're suitable for a wide, a really a wide range of applications because you don't have to worry so much about corrosion resistance. They are plastic parts, so they won't corrode if they're used underwater. They won't, they won't be compromised if used with heavy dirt. They, they're fine with Rojas compliance. They don't contain lead. They are dimensionally interchangeable with a lot of the PTFE metal back bearing products, so we have drop-in replacements. Um, they also have a, a larger wear surface, so they are able to um, dissipate the, the, the load under over a greater surface area, reducing the pressure. They're lighter weight because they're all plastic, and they have a predictable lifetime. At least at IGUS, we have an online calculator where you can calculate the lifetime of the products based on your application. These are some wear charts uh, comparing PTFE lined uh, versus IGUS plastic parts. And you see the um, it's a DU bearing in test here with a certain pressure of 1 megapascal at a velocity of 0.01 meters per second. You see that under aluminum hard coat, case hardened steel, which is CF53, um, ST37, I'm not sure what the, um, the American call out for that type of steel is. It might be... Uh, tooling steel, I'm not sure. V2A is a stainless steel. You see in almost all of these instances that the DU bearing is considerably higher wear than the than the IGUS plastic parts. Here's an application on a pedal for a mountain bike where iGlide, IGUS iGlide bearings replaced PT, PTFE bearings. Um, the iGlide bearings not only cost less, but the main advantage for this customer is that the end users did not have to replace 
the the bearings and the pedals, the plastic bearings offered by I guess lasted the entire life of the of the pedals for their customers, and that's because they um, again no bonded liner or it's a complete homogeneous plastic part, so there's no surface to peel um, to peel like the I made the analogy to a Teflon pan earlier, similar similar thing. Um, plastic bearings are lighter weight and also corrosion resistant without steel parts since they're all plastic. All right, the final product that we're going to be comparing I guess plastics to is recirculating ball bearings. So these are ball bearings designed specifically for linear use in which the balls run through a linear raceway. At one point during the, re the re revolution of these parts through the raceway, they go through a, a lubricate, lubrication bath that, that has oil or grease in it um, that re-lubricates the rollers or the balls. Um, most of these type of bushings do require constant maintenance and as well as require additional components like zerks, um, grease zerks, fittings, lubrication lines, seals, or etc. Um, these can be either round shaped or profile shaped like kind of like a T shape. The main benefits of a lin recirculating linear ball bearing is that you can have a higher combination of load and speed than you can with a sliding bearing like a plastic part. The precision is extremely um, they have extremely good precision relative to any type of plane bearing be it a bronze bearing or a plastic bearing since they are they are rolling element bearings. They can be used in applications on machine tools and things requiring extreme precision, unlike a plane bearing. Also, they're very low friction if they're properly maintained. If you, they're properly oiled and greased, they have a very low friction, which means that they're more suitable than plane bearings are for highly cantilever loads. Some of the down points is that they must be constantly lubri uh, lubricated and maintained. Um, one major oil company did a study and it determined that to properly relubricate a single grease point takes three minutes. So if you break that out, um, one study suggested that at, to lubricate uh, 20 grease points annually, seven times per week on one machine costs that company $7,300 to, to maintain. There's also the cost of the um, ancillary components like the fittings, the grease guns, the, the um, if there's a central lubrication system installed, things like that. They're also not very well designed for dirty environments because, again, dirt is drawn into the lubrication, and they're not ideal for clean applications because lubrication could leak out onto into the sensitive environment. Maybe it's a lab or a food processing application. All right, plastic bearings have a lower cost of ownership because they do not require any maintenance. Once they're installed, the idea is that they last for as long as the designer of the equipment had intended the machine to last. They are suitable for harsh environments and ideal for high impact loads, shocks or vibrations. I know plastic bearings are used very often in um, high vibration applications on fitness equipment to save wear and tear on the rider. Also, we have other customers who have um, high shock loads that would damage ball bearings, would actually damage the shafting that a ball bearing rides on because of the point-to-point -point contact. Um, they are suitable, plastic bearings are suitable for soft, shaft, soft shafting like aluminum or 300 series stainless. Also suitable for shorter strokes. I mentioned earlier that recirculating ball bearings, every one revolution have to pass through a, an oil bath to be re-lubricated. They're not, that's not a requirement with the plastic part. And plastic parts are also quiet and lightweight. Here's an application in the packaging industry on a vertical, vertical form fill seal machine. So this is the type of machine that might seal bags of Doritos or some, some, something like that. So the, the product gets dropped into a bag. The welding jaws are guided by drylin parts, which then seal the top of the bag, the same part of the bag that you peel open to, to eat them. The um, drylin replaced ball bearings in the, in the welding jaw application because we were able to increase the machine's cycle per minute by 20%, mostly due to the fact that plane bearings aren't limited to accelerations like ball bearings are. Ball bearings are affected, are greatly affected by accelerations because of the moment of inertia of the balls. If you exceed what the ball bearing 
recommended um, acceleration is, you can actually damage the shafting. So this customer had to artificially slow down the machine to use ball bearings, but when they used, I guess, pl plastic sliding parts, it worked um, It worked fine, and they could actually increase the throughput of the machine. Also, plastic bearings are lower cost up front than ball bearings. So there was a cost savings related to this as well. All right, and with that, I will turn it back to Nicole. Thank you, Matt. At this point, we're going to talk a little bit more about implementing iGlide plastic bearings specifically into your application. So specifically talking about iGlide plastic bearings, we normally have a few rules that we try to follow. The first is that we check temperature, static surface pressure, and speed. So when we're talking about temperature, for example, iGlide bearings range from um, 482 degrees long term to negative 158 Fahrenheit. So a pretty wide temperature range available with iGlide plastic bearings. We're also talking specifically about static surface pressure and most of our bearings can um, see different a variety. We do have quite a few different um, composite blends but we can see up to about 22,000 PSI. And speed is another factor. So maximum speeds vary depending on the type of motion. So in a rotating application, we would normally recommend continuous of 295 feet per minute, excuse me, and oscillating about 216 feet per minute, and in a linear motion, um, about 1,900 feet per minute. So you can imagine in a linear motion that there's more heat dissipation as the bearings covering more surface area. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, down the line. But Secondary and probably actually one of the most critical would be the max PV value, so taking into account the surface pressure and the speed. So generally for iGlide bearings, we like to say that we like to fall under 28,500 um, for PV, so PSI times feet per minute, and that's in a permanently dry running application. So as Matt mentioned earlier, sometimes the addition of lubricants might change that number and you know help increase that number, but our bearings are meant to be used in dry running applications, so that's why we um, provide that number for you. Typical applications for iGlide bearings involve low speeds, so less than 60 feet per minute, or high loads, you know, maybe up to 15,000 PSI rotating or oscillating. Normally, we would recommend the use of a hardened shaft in applications that see greater than 700 PSI. And another factor to consider would be um, that the total sliding distance be less than 6,000 miles, and there must be a clearance of about two to four thousandths. And you can imagine uh, we need a certain amount of clearance for a couple of reasons. One is to take into account any type of thermal expansion that might happen or moisture absorption. And also in addition to that, if there's no clearance and with a sliding element, you can imagine that the bearing will bind and won't, um, won't actually move in your application. So a certain amount of clearance is recommended. The most critical factor in determining the use of a plane bearing, I would say a plastic plane bearing, would be PV value. So friction heat is created when the shaft moves inside of the bearing, and we determine PV by the values present in the application for pressure and speed. So by multiplying these two factors, we find the we actually find our PV value, or the measure of the amount created of the heat created. So we measure this with pressure again, as mentioned in PSI, and velocity in feet per minute. The actual PV value is a harder standard than permissible PV, which might allow for slightly higher values depending on other factors. So when we're talking about PV value, it's important to distinguish how we're dissipating the heat from the bearing. The first way is through um, the bearing into the housing, and secondly, through the shaft outside of the bearing. So some factors influencing PV, as just mentioned, thermal conductivity of shaft and housing, and along with the bearing material. So some shafts and housing materials have, um, have better thermal conductivity than others. Plastics in general, uh, as Matt mentioned earlier, do not necessarily have the best thermal conductivity, so we need to take a look at that in conjunction with all of the mating components. Coefficient of friction is another important factor that helps to influence PV. The maximum temperature limit of the bearing material itself, so as mentioned, we have quite a wide range here, and it's important to take that into account when discussing PV. And in our expert system, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, when you plug in your application temperature, it will take all these factors into account and do actually do the math for you. So the ambient temperature in the application is another key consideration. And the wall thickness of the bearing and the length. So thinner wall thicknesses and shorter bearing lengths allow for less heat buildup than helping to increase the permissible PV. Another important factor when um, talking about a sliding versus a rolling element, 
would be the two to one rule that we have here at IGUS. Um, and most linear plane bearings also have this same general guideline. So what basically this means is that any load affecting the system, be it the drive force or the payload, must be less than two times the distance of that bearing, of the bearings that are spaced on one shaft. So you can see based on the diagram here, um, the F is the force, and then you would need the um, you need that to be no more than two times the distance center to center of those two um, carriages or bearings. Some other considerations would be shaft material. So plastic bearings offer the advantage that they're able to run on a variety of shafts. With iGlide bearings, for example, we have over 30 different standard material grades, meaning that there's likely a material that will meet best with the shafting that you're using. Shaft roughness is another important key consideration. So in general, we say linear applications, we recommend 8 to 16 RMS, and rotating or oscillating applications, 16 to 64. That does vary based on um, a few factors, including the bearing shaft combination. And all of that information can be found in our catalog um, under each material grade. Or um, certainly you can ask somebody in, in our sales department. By not having a very smooth or polished shaft, most customers are able to save money. So the roughness helps extract the self-lubricants from the bearing material, helping to create what we consider an optimal sliding surface. So some of our customers in the past have come to us and assumed that they need a polished shaft. And in fact, a polished shaft is not necessarily ideal. Actually, it's usually not ideal in our applications. So you can save money that way as well. Hardness of the shaft is critical. So when using a softer shaft, it's possible that the bearing material will actually smooth during the break-in phase. Abrasive points are then worn, worn off and surface gets rebuilt. So for some materials, this effect can have positive influences and wear resistance of the bearing increases. Each bearing material, depending on the makeup, is resistant to certain chemicals. So any chemicals present in the application will help determine the material selection. We have quite a large um, array of chemicals that we've done testing on for each of our bearing materials that can be found in our catalog and with information on how resistant those we are to those specific chemicals. Another consideration when specking in a polymer plastic bearing would be any certifications required. So for example, quite a few customers need um, FDA compliance, some um, horizontal burn test acceptability, and also um, Rojas compliance, and all of that we can provide for certain bearing materials. So now that we've talked about some key considerations when implementing a plastic bearing into your application, specifically an iGlide bearing, you might be asking what exactly is an iGlide bearing. So iGlide bearings are engineered plastics. As mentioned, we have more than 30 different materials. So they're all tribal polymers that are meant to meet your specific needs. So we also have another 150 additional materials for special custom requests or needs. And all of our bearings, as Matt had mentioned, are tested and predictable. So we can run that lifetime calculation that I spoke of earlier and help you determine exactly how long these bearings will last in your particular application. So how do we get those numbers and how do we arrive at what we consider our expert system? We do that through our IGUS test facility. So all of this is done in our German facility, our corporate headquarters. And we currently run over 10,000 plastic bearing tests annually. So tests are run in order to help predict the lifetime of the bearing based on a variety of factors. We have in the past and certainly can also conduct customer specific tests when requested. Another great advantage to our lab is that's where all iGlide materials are developed. So they're all developed in-house with our own team of um, engineers. So in the course of a year, hundreds of materials are worked on, and based on testing and customer requests, a few will become what we consider a named material, so something that you end up seeing in the catalog. The remainder remain um, research materials for use in specific applications when needed. So if there is something that you require that for some reason one of our 30 named materials can't meet, it does not mean that we don't have a solution for you. These tests also help us determine ideal shaft materials and finishes for each bearing material what the allowable temperatures would be, and chemical resistance for them. Currently, we have 26 standard test rigs set up in the lab, and these are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Here's just a screenshot of our expert systems. And actually, um, the iGlide expert system you see in the left is brand new, so we have a little bit different version of that now online. So these are the calculators that Matt spoke about, our lifetime calculators. They're available on our website and updated regularly. So if we add materials, we are able to um, add those immediately to the expert system online. They are very easy to use, um, and you can also 
certainly contact us and we can help you work through this or um, do this for you. And again, I think making um, bearings predictable is a key component of you feeling confident in implementing a plastic bearing into your application. So now that we've talked a little bit about um, iGlide as a brand name, let's now talk about iGus as a company. So iGus is a German company and we have a manufacturing plant in Cologne, Germany. It does all of our processing, production, and distribution. And then here in the U.S. we have a, um, our North American headquarters are located in East Providence, Rhode Island. We stock a number of parts, so most parts are available to ship within 24 hours or less. So we have approximately 1,600 employees throughout um, throughout the world and over 28 IGAS subsidiaries worldwide. So quite a bit of support located throughout the world if you need it, and certainly um, everybody's more than willing to help you. A variety of different product groups. So we've talked about iGlide. We also carry cable carriers continuously flexing cables. Ready Chain, which is a pre-harness system, and we already spoke a little bit about iGlide. Uh, we have IGUBAL self-aligning plastic bearings, and then we spoke a little bit already about dry and linear bearings. Thank you, everybody, and at this point, I'd like to turn it back to Michael Hardy. Now we're ready to take some questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Matt and Nicole. I'm going to start off with our first question. Uh, this question is going to be answered by Matt Mowry. Hi there. Thanks for listening again. I appreciate your time. First question is, uh, the question comes about how to, de how to describe the self-aligning feature of, I guess, plastic bearings. And what they're referring to is I mentioned during the linear bearing portion that we have bearings that are self-aligning. Um, we actually have two styles of self-aligning bearings. One style would be a type of bearing much like a rod end or a spherical bearing that is pressed into a housing that can pivot to adjust between any, uh, adjust for any misalignments you might have in your assembly process. Uh, might be really important if you're trying to assemble a shaft in between two sheet metal components or to something plastic or not flat. Another type of self-aligning question, another type of self-aligning bearing we have is a linear self-aligning bearing, which actually, I mentioned the two, or Nicole actually mentioned the two to one rule during her portion of the presentation. Generally speaking, for every linear bearing application using an IGUS type bearing, you want to float one of the rails and what you'll do is you'll float it towards the other rail. How we achieve that is we artificially make the floating bearing um, between half a thou and uh, 50 thousandths narrower or, or wider than the fixed bearing, and that will actually allow one of the sides of the rails to float. We can, um, if you visit our website and you go to Tech Talk and you visit the two to one rule page, it talks more in depth about fixed and floating bearings. The second question comes about plastic composite bearings, what type of temperature ranges they can uh, be used at. I guess composite plastics can be used at temperatures as low as 148 degrees Fahrenheit to uh, close to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, it's about 482, and that's for under 10 minutes. For applications exceeding that, um, or sorry, that's for over 10 minutes. For applications exceeding that, we can see temperatures up to 600 degrees for short term. And I'll pass it over to Nicole for the next few. Okay, the next question is, what might be the best IGUS bearing material to use in deep, high-pressure underwater applications, so specifically for ocean seawater applications? And we do have quite a few bearing materials that can withstand pretty high temperatures. Specifically, um, for underwater-type applications, I would uh, look in the direction of our H family or our T500. Um, we do need to specifically find out from um, from you some more detailed application information, and then that way we can help determine um, the best bearing material suited for, for that particular application. But we do have some bearing materials that can withstand these types of environments. The next question is the chemical compatibility with strong acids. So for example, sulfuric acid or oxidizer, so bleach and hydrogen peroxide. Again, we also have quite a few bearing materials that can withstand these chemicals, and depending on the type of concentration, might depend on the um, bearing material that would work. We do have a full chemical composition chart located in our catalog or online. We can also certainly submit that to you, so for these questions being asked online, we'll be happy to include that um, with our response to you once we're um, through with the webinar. And now I'm going to turn it over to Matt 
Yeah, and the question is, how does friction in a plastic sliding bearing compare to a friction in a, a ball bearing? Generally speaking, we use a static coefficient of friction of our parts of about 0.25, and ball bearings are approximately 0.01. 0.25, again, is the static coefficient of friction, and that, that's kind of a worst-case scenario. In our test lab, we've done testing which shows that they can be considerably lower, um, closer to 0.1. And I'll pass it back to Nicole now. Okay. So the next question is, are there any bearing materials which will operate in a negative 40C environment? Um, yes, there are. And actually, as Matt mentioned, it's negative 148 in Fahrenheit, which I think translates to about a negative 100 Celsius. So we definitely have some bearing materials that would work in that type of um, temperature range. The next question we have is, um, Matt, Matt's going to yeah. go ahead and answer. So the next question comes about um, what is the next step in the evolution of plastic bearings. At I guess we're constantly researching and developing materials. Um, basically, we're trying to develop bearing materials for wherever your marketplace is taking us. So. We, we do like to get a lot of input. A lot of new materials are generated from customer-specific applications that we then identify and, and basically design new materials for. On a, a more general note, we're always looking to reduce the friction in our, our sliding components. We mentioned this two-to-one rule earlier. We do have an internal challenge to try to get to a, a, a ratio of a five-to-one relationship for the linear bearing product line, as well as Inc uh, increasing the wear characteristics of the part is something we're always testing for as well. So another question that was asked is, do the solid lubricants, lubricants migrate out of the base polymer over time? And um, the answer to that is yes, but we all of our bearings are homogeneously blended. So the solid lubricants will uh, migrate out of the plastic over time, basically um, filling the peaks and valleys of your shaft, which will then help uh, create an optimal sliding surface. But what's unique about our bearings, because they are homogeneously blended, the solid lubricants will never disappear from the bearing material. So they are homogeneously blended throughout the bearing. Another question comes about the, um, the benefits of IGUS bearings in a dirty environment. And the question is, they understand where dirt is uh, attracted to, to grease in traditional bearings. The question is, is it possible to have dirt embed into the plastic bearings and create problems? Generally speaking, it's not a problem with plastic bearings. Um, if, if, if the parts are able to get uh, a lot of moisture, so if it's a wet environment with a very highly abrasive material like used in the construction of concrete uh, materials, it could be an issue if, if it's really wet and it becomes a real abrasive. But generally speaking, plastic bearings are designed to run dry and work very well as self-wiping systems in very dirty environments. Some of our, mo many of our largest OEM customers are those who are working on outdoor um, agricultural applications, lawn mowers, tractors, things of that nature. So they work very well in dirty environments. It's one of our primary markets. Oh, does the inadvertent application of lubricants have negative effects on eye glide bearings? Generally speaking, of course, all of our parts are designed to run dry and, you know, maintenance-free and don't require oil. However, we do know that a lot of our, a lot of the end users of the equipment using our parts may lubricate the parts. We do have problems, actually, if customers are using things like uh, spray-on, WD-40, parts like that. Generally speaking, the propellants in spray-type lubricants or, or cleaners can have a negative impact on the frictional characteristics of the parts. But if it's a petroleum-based product, lightweight grease or oil, it shouldn't ha should not have a negative impact on the part. Another question that came up is, um, what is the max dynamic pressure for IGUS bearings? And that's a difficult question to answer. Um, we normally test, so the catalog values are based on our static, uh, max static load, so depending on the amount of pressure. So usually about 28,000 PSI. And then that's on the max side, so that's with really low um, speed. So dynamic questions regarding dynamic pressure are difficult to answer in terms of our plastic bearings. For us, what's most critical is that we take the amount of surface pressure and multiply it by the velocity to get the max PV value. And that's how we would measure um, your dynamic, uh, an application with a dynamic 
um, motion. Uh, question is comes if they if they provided us the current linear bearing specs they are using if that would be enough for me to fit or for us to fit a composite bearing if the load and speed was provided absolutely if you contact us with your application it is definitely something one of our sales engineers can take a look at very quickly and provide you um, either a feasible solution or we'll explain why we don't work in your particular application. Another another question is can 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 we have a shoulder bearing split for in field installation? I guess does offer in in several of our product lines split bearings which are able to be assembled in the field without the without disassembly of the shaft from the machine or the equipment. So the answer is yes. It would depend, of course, on the exact bearing you're using and if we would have a direct interchange. But but we do offer products like that. Um, do we, sorry Nicole, I'm, uh, I see yeah, another one here. Uh, do we have much experience with plastic bearings in weld, welded environments? Actually one of our, we have a large application on one of the global welding guns designed for automotive use, um, automotive robots, um, that does see hot weld spatter or sparks. Um, generally speaking we don't have a problem with that as, as long as the weldment is somewhat cool by the time it uh, not the welding, but the welding material is somewhat cooled by the time it hits the plastic. It's, it's not a problem. At least it's not in the one particular auto automotive application I'm thinking of right now. We actually um, have an application with our swimming rings, the same type of environment that Pat's speaking of. Okay, so there's a question on how to calculate the area for the PV rating. There's actually a formula in our catalog for that. Um, I can give it to you. So it's basically just your, you, all you're doing is um, calculating the amount of uh, surface pressure. So it's basically the, the load in pounds divided by the ID of the bearing multiplied by the length of the bearing, and that's in inches. So you would take the load in pounds and um, divide that by the V1 times the V1 or the ID times the length. Another question here about how plastic bearing, bearings behave to outside impacts, such as hammering the piece to fit. Um, that's, I see that as a two-part question. The, the first part is, are generally speaking, our, our bushings are, are meant as press fit parts. We do recommend an arbor press, most likely not recommended to hammer in place with a hammer, am I correct, Nicole? Or, right. Mm -hmm. But the other part of that is once installed, they work extremely well in impact applications, especially compared to ball bearing or bronze bearings. Ball bearings, because of that point-to-point -point contact, have a, a problem where they can gall or damage the shaft. Bronze bearings have the problem that they're, they're not as uh, forgiving for impact loads as plastic parts, and they, they can break. So yes, plastic bearings are good for impact loads. Another question, can your catalog be downloaded? Yes, if you go to www.igus.com, there is a, an area there to download it. Um, we can provide that to you, but we'll send the link to the person who asked that question, absolutely. There's another question here about um, is there any product regarding plastic bearings compatible with the nuclear industry, so material harding, hardening due to radiation? We do have some materials that are actually um, resistant to radiation and all that's listed in our catalog as well. Um, of course, it would depend on the levels of radiation and we can give you some specific numbers. So if um, for the person asking that question, we'll be happy to get that to you. Um, Question here about um, customer has a linear application using linear bearings in a dusty environment, but they are interested in using a composite. They're currently using polished, hardened shafts. Would you need to replace those shafts? No. You can, as long as the tolerances are the standard linear bearing tolerances, which if you're using inch parts are approximately five tenths to one thousandth of an inch, you don't need to replace the shafting. You can use our our plastic linear bearings on those shafts, but it's a good idea if we got in touch with you as well to, to double check some of the specifics on that. Another question asked is uh, what size range do you offer? So if we're talking just about our plane bearings, we go anywhere from one millimeter up to about 150 millimeters or about an eighth of an inch to about three, three and a half inches um, on the inch side. 
So we have quite a larger range, um, both in metric and in inch. Question here about do we have products with UL94VO ratings? We do have certain materials that are rated, and for those of you who are not familiar with that terminology, that's a UL rating for a vertical burn test, which basically states that the, the, the material should be self-extinguishing in a vertical orientation. Uh, we do have materials that will pass that if that's an application for um, consumer use or for a lot of aircraft interiors require that for certain size products. We do. Another question is um, typical press fit and running clearances for the iGlide bearings. Um, generally speaking, our running clearance runs about two to four thousandths, but that changes depending um, on your specific um, Another one here for any thrust bearing applications. We do use quite a few um, thrust washers in our in applications as well as flange bearings where the flange is acting as a basically supporting an axial load. So the answer to that question is absolutely we can handle thrust washer or thrust bearing applications. Another question here about where are IGUS bearings produced. All of the bearings that IGUS makes are currently produced at our injection molding facility in Cologne, Germany. However, most of the catalog is um, inventoried in East Providence, Rhode Island, and we're able to ship out parts within a same day or next day from our facility here in the U.S. to Canada, Mexico, and the States. Another question is, although lubrication to plastic bearings is not needed due to the self-lubrication properties of the polymers, is there a benefit to adding additional lubrication? Are there any negative effects? Um, basically, in terms of that, um, there can be a benefit at times. Um, there can be a benefit at times to adding additional lubrication. So, for example, if it's an underwater application and the water is acting as a lubricant, that can help prolong the life of the bearing. Um, the, probably the biggest issue is that if you start to lubricate the bearing, would you recommend that you continue to do so? Um, in terms of what lubricant is recommended, normally we recommend like a three-in-one or an industrial grease. Uh, this question about do we have applications where particle generation is prohibited? We are rated, if, in case you're using, if some of you may be looking for clean room ratings for, uh, clean room ratings for electronics manufacturing or semiconductor, we do have certain, we have passed ISO clean room ratings. It does depend on the load and speed of the part, so that's definitely something that we would like to contact you specifically about your applications, but it is possible. Thank you, Matt and Nicole. I think this has uh, been a wonderful webinar, and I hope we've answered most, if not all, of your questions. Um, as, the, uh, as we wrap everything up, we will send uh, an email out to everyone who we didn't quite get to. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will be giving away a, uh, an iPad mini to one lucky uh, attendee for today's event. Um, following this webinar, everyone will be receiving an email with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation along with a PDF copy of this PowerPoint and a transcript of the questions and answers. Um, lastly, I'd just like to thank Global Spec for helping IGUS to put on this webinar. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and have a wonderful day.